So with that as a, a backdrop, let's look at the motivation for MBSC. Let's start with this term digital engineering. This is a, a term that has become popular over the last several years as part of what's called the digital transformation. And I think we all see that in our everyday lives, uh, this digitization of, of all the data, moving from documents to digital form. Uh, but digital engineering is, is more than just transforming your data into a digital form like a PDF document. That would not be per se digital engineering. What we want to do is we want to transform that data into structured data that has meaning. And when we do that, we have the ability to, to operate on that data and we can uh, interpret it and process it with computers. And this enables automation, it enables sharing of the data across different tools. So it's a very powerful concept. So, but the need here is to have your data captured in a structured form. Well, turns out that's what models are. Models are a form of structuring your data and providing semantics or meaning to that data. And so a model-based approach is in fact exactly what is the engineer's answer to this digital engineering approach. The notion of managing this data across the life cycle is the critical aspect of digital engineering. And we'll reinforce that point as we go forward. Just as an aside, DE also refers to the digital enterprise. It's used that way as well. But it's basically applying the same concept of getting structured data with meaning, but at the enterprise level, at the business level. So data can be shared, interpreted, and processed across the entire enterprise, not just across engineering. So model-based system engineering fits in the context of digital engineering. It's an approach where information about the system is captured in a systems model. And the idea is that this model is the source of, of the authoritative source of data for the system design, and it's managed throughout the life cycle. That's, that's our goal, that's our intent with an MBSC approach. It contrasts with a document-based approach, which is more of our traditional system engineering approach, where we did a lot of analysis, we did good design work, but the actual capture of the information was spread across many different documents and informal diagrams and spreadsheets. So the data is spread everywhere. What we're trying to do here is to move from that document-based approach, where you see in this example, uh, different members of stakeholders involved in the development are sharing their data with these document-based artifacts and that's what you see over here on the left, to move towards a model-based approach, and this just you know, indicates the notion of a system model in the center here, where everybody is talking to the same model and contributing to the same model. If we do that, we have the ability to provide a more complete, a more consistent, and a more traceable system design. In the NCOSI Systems Engineering Vision 2035, the future of system engineering is model-based. This is a quote directly from this vision. And it's considered part of the digital transformation. Model-based approach for system engineering is fundamentally just part of the digital transformation in the same way that I just said it was part of digital engineering. In order to really move forward in the future uh, with this model-based approach, the scope of MBSC has to expand and we're gonna need to evolve our standards and our tools and our methodologies so that the model-based approach can apply across the entire life cycle from conceptual design through development, through production, even to deployment and out in the field. 
So we're going to need this full life cycle approach to model-based systems engineering to evolve that system model, if you will. And we're going to need the model-based approach to apply at the system of system level, down to the system level, subsystem, component, all the way up and down this vertical st stack, if you will, from system system down to component level. So there's sort of these two dimensions that define the scope of MBSE, the life cycle dimension and this vertical stack kind of dimension. In order to be effective, model-based system engineering will need to be complemented by agile practices. They really do go hand in hand, but you can have one without the other. But when I, when I refer to agile practices, I'm not necessarily referring to exactly the way they refer to it in software. But from a system perspective, it means things like automated workflow. So automating our workflow will be critical. Also, configuration management is an enormous challenge, particularly when you're talking about configuration management of the digital thread. And by that, I mean all the different digital artifacts that are created as you move throughout this life cycle. There's different, different artifacts, and each artifact uh, changes at its own rate, uh, sort of asynchronously. And so this is a huge challenge. So I think we have the scope issue of moving MBSE to the scope of the full life cycle and the, and the vertical stack, and at the same time, uh, integrating it with these agile practices that I'm referring to here. And the other aspect is really leveraging reuse and patterns. Patterns are very important when it comes to modeling. If you can define the right patterns, you can use that pattern over and over again uh, across your different system designs. If we do this, what does it facilitate? Well, first, it just helps us to manage complexity and risk. If we have these kind of models that extend across the life cycle, that extend across the vertical stack, uh, that are enabled by Agile, and, and we, we have the ability to manage the evolving complexity of our systems and the associated development risk, technical, cost, schedule type risk. We have the ability to more rapidly respond to changes in requirements in technology. We have the ability to evolve our design, re, again reuse and evolve the design. We have improved ability to reason about the systems, ask questions of these system models and, and query them and get responses. I mean, the simple example would be the change impact that I referred to before. It sounds simple, it's actually very complex. If you make this change to a requirement, what's the impact on the rest of the system? We'd like our models to help us answer that question. And of course, perform all different kinds of engineering analysis on our systems. And clearly provide that shared stakeholder understanding. We're talking about both the engineering design team, uh, program management, the customer, and others who have a stake in this system and its development. And finally, the ability to have these kind of models can really help us with automated documentation and reporting. So we can generate reports of all kinds that help us give, give us visibility into the state of our system and other aspects. So let's say a few words about system models. What are we talking about when we say this system model? Well, we start by just thinking of functional models and physical models. So a functional model describes what the system does and what its components do. So it's functional in nature. The physical model defines what are the components of the system, how are they interconnected. Those are, you know, we tend to use the term physical models. So these sort of provide the core of a system model, is bringing this functional model and physical model together. But it doesn't stop there. There's many other aspects. So for example, 
we want to bring in the dynamic performance models or simulation models. Uh, now, SysML, you'll see later, is not a dynamic performance model in and of itself, but it can help specify a dynamic performance model. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And similarly, there are many other analysis models that are needed that describe this system and are used to, in effect, analyze different aspects of the system. Mass properties, reliability, cost, various aspects of manufacturing, what have you. This, this list is a very, very long list of different types of analysis tools. So the idea is to start to bring all this data together. In addition, we need to bring in requirements. And we need to incorporate that into the system model. And then we need to incorporate verification. So all of these different aspects can be brought together into a system model. So this is the kind of thing that we're talking about when we refer to a system model. So how do we use this system model? Let's look at this V process. It's a traditional V process. It's basically an inverted image of the pyramid that I showed in the earlier slide. It's basically a similar, same concept, but just a mirror image. In this V process, we flow the requirements down the left-hand side of the V, and, and we, we develop designs, requirements and design iteratively going down the left-hand side of the V. And then we integrate and test going up the right-hand side of the V. So in the traditional V process, what happens is you flow the requirements down to the component level, and then the, you do the detailed design, you implement that design, you build it, and then you begin testing on the right-hand side of the V. You, you test and integrate and test your components into subsystems and subsystems into systems and systems even into system of systems until you get up to the mission level. The problem is you find errors on that right-hand side of the V. And so you have to go all the way back to the left-hand side of the V and basically repeat what you did, identify what the, the issue was, address it, and in effect go through the flow down process again and then come back to the right-hand side of the V and do the integration and test again. That is very time consuming. It's very costly. So the idea is this notion of virtual integration, and this is really important to a, a model-based system engineering approach. And what that means is we flow requirements down, but we be begin the verification, the integration and verification early in the design process. And we do that through analytical models. So we, we use the system model to flow the requirements in design down, and then we tie it into the analysis models that are then used to verify that those requirements are satisfied going up. And we continue that process as we move down the V. So by the time you get to the bottom part of the V and you're actually ready to build and test the system, you have already surfaced many of the issues and you reduce the surprises, you reduce the number of issues, and therefore uh, this can result in significant savings in cost and schedule and risk to the program. This slide comes from, as with the previous slide, comes from uh, an NDIA report. NDIA is the National Defense Industry Association. And it was on model-based engineering, and it was some time, many years ago. But it's still a good report, and uh, the results are still completely valid and relevant. And what you're looking at here is you see a life cycle uh, from the time. And so up front, they call it material solution, but it's conceptual design, if you will, up front. And it goes on through development and manufacturing, you know, production, and, and out ultimately into deployment and out into the field. So a, a sort of a typical life cycle for a system development. So to support the design of the system, you start out early in the design, conceptual design, and you have a team of engineers from coming from different disciplines along with the customer and manufacturing and 
perhaps program management, and they're all, they all bring their own unique set of tools and models to the table. And the system engineer is one of those. So the system engineer is at this virtual table, if you will. But the, what the system engineer has a unique role because the system engineer tries to act as glue to integrate the design across this team. So this is part of that multidisciplinary role. And the system model is the mechanism by which they can enable that. So they work together, start, you know, working from the shared understanding of the overall system, and then each of the designers basically further elaborates based on that system model. So it supports this flow down process from mission down to system and subsystem, ultimately to component, but all the different disciplines can participate in that process as you evolve this system model and you build this little icon shown there is representative of, of the system model early in the life cycle. And then as you move down the life cycle, you continue to evolve those models in depth, in levels of detail as your design matures. And that continues throughout the life cycle until you deploy the system to the field. And so the challenge is to manage that technical baseline, which is what the, those models constitute, it's the so-called authoritative source of truth, it's really your technical baseline, to manage that across the life cycle. In order to do that, we, in, in this model-based engineering to be state, we introduce this concept of a collaborative foundation. And that was the term that was used uh, for this report. But basically, the collaborative foundation is a set of processes and tools that are used to manage that technical data, those models, the authoritative source of truth, all really synonyms for the same thing, to manage that data as you cross this life cycle. And it provides a governance, it controls access, it manages versions, it does all kinds of things to manage that data. And that's critically important part of MBSC. It's, it's the complementary part. So we talk about the system model and having that system model is central, but having the ability to manage the data is also central. Those two pieces together and doing those effectively and bringing in this notion of agile practices, that's where you get a real model-based engineering to be state that we want to achieve.